In the July 2018 edition of What's New Massachusetts, we revisit one of our favorite shows and take a pub crawl to Boston's historic taverns. Learn about the City on a Hill's weird history from Brooke Barbier, author of Boston and the American Revolution, A Town Versus an Empire. She's the founder of the Ye Old Tavern Tours, which offer a spirited journey to the historic sites and taverns along the Freedom Trail and Fenway Park. What's new, Massachusetts? Here are your co-hosts, Sam Baltrusis and Sharon Filion. Welcome to What's New Massachusetts. My name is Sam Baltrusis. I'm an author and journalist. Joining me is my lovely co-host, Sharon Filia. Hi, Sam. So, Sharon, it's summer. Yes, and July 4th is upon us. Absolutely. We have barbecue, we have fireworks, and we have history. Yes, and as most of you know, Boston is at the center of American history. Absolutely. We have people coming from all over the world to visit us during the summer. Yes, there's so much to see. Now, we did a, a bit on taverns, um, which is which is the focus of, of one of our shows, uh, and it, it, it comes to the fore in this program as well because it's part of American history. Yeah, taverns are the epicenter of colonial America and Boston specifically. I mean, there are all sorts of things happen in taverns. People would gather there. Mm -hmm. They would use them as inns. Uh, during the Salem witch trials, for example, they would do um, they would check for witch marks in the tavern. So there's all sorts of things good and bad that happen in taverns throughout history. Right, and it's really interesting. That's where news was primarily disseminated, in taverns. That's, that's where you found out all the dirt. So for our first visit, we're actually going to one of the newer taverns. It is American Fresh Brew House. Yes, and what's so great about it, it started out as a beer garden, became so popular that it became a brick and mortar. Now it is so popular, and not only is their beer great, and they actually make it right in-house, they also have a great eating menu. So let's check out American Fresh Brew House in Assembly Row. This is Sharon Filiar for What's New Massachusetts. Here we are in Assembly Row at the American Fresh Brew House, a beautiful brick and mortar establishment right here in Assembly Row. Now what's so special about this place is that it started as a beer garden outside and now they're inside. We're going to be speaking to General Manager Ray Rabitsky about that and about other things that are going on here in just a moment. now with Mr. Ray Rabitsky. He is the general manager of American Fresh Brew House. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Wow, now this establishment started out as a beer garden outside. Tell us about that. Yeah, so a couple years back we opened up a beer garden. This is on the other side of uh, this assembly row here. And um, over the years it became one of the most popular spots in this area. Outdoors, open, having a beer when it's super hot outside is an awesome experience and it's only kind, only thing like it's kind of here in Assembly Row. It is, and what's really great um, and that I haven't seen too many places is that children can stay with their parents while they're enjoying a drink. That usually does not happen. So that's a tremendous draw in addition to Partners Healthcare being across the way. So you get a lot of those employees as well. Yeah, especially during the work week. We have a lot of employees that just come after a long day's work. They come sit down, they put all their bags down, their jackets off, and they sit down. And I'm like, I know exactly what you need. Don't worry. <laughs> now we actually spoke before taping and you mentioned that you can tell the type of day one of the employees has had by the type of beer that they order. So if someone is having a particularly bad day, what beer would they order? Uh, probably our Trekker Triple, which is our Belgian Golden Ale, which is just slightly above 9%. Okay, and if they've had a good day, what would they order? Uh, probably our Happy Soul Blood Orange Hefeweiz, a nice easy drink. Okay, so when they've had a really tough day, they go for the hard stuff. Got it, got it, got it. Now, what I really enjoyed was that they have a really great menu here as well. I was just eyeing these wonderful wontons with jalapeno and cheese. But what is your favorite uh, selection on the menu? Uh, probably our Brussels sprouts. Yeah, that is not my favorite. <laughs> It wasn't my favorite when I first started, uh, but with our fantastic cooks and chef here, I definitely recommend it to our customers. But you know, the American Fresh Brew House not only is great for its cuisine and, and because you have wonderful brew, uh, beers here, 
you're also really accessible. Assembly Row is burgeoning. There are so many shops here. We're right across from the Orange Line. It's easy to get through, to get here and get through here, and access to 93. And this is sort of like the second wave of a sort of, um, of establishments that are kind of building up Assembly Row to make it even more attractive, not just to live, but to just come in and to have a great time. So um, how do you feel about all that? I mean, it's great. We're only like, what, 30 feet away from the tea station. So especially for uh, Bruins or Celtics games at the Garden, we're only a few stops away. So people will come here before the game, come here after the game as well. And just commuters during the work week, they, this, we're the first restaurant they see when they get off the tea. So as soon as they get off the tea, they're like, we're going there. Now, I'd like to ask you about some of these very interesting names of the beers. I know there are quite a few of them, but we, I know you mentioned a few of them earlier. But what are some of the other names of your brews here? Um, so probably our most popular beers are Flag Razor IPA, um, and we go through a rotating draft of beers. So we we'll typically have about uh, six or eight beers that we have year round, and then everything else, every month we have something new. Like last week we got two new beers. We have a Doppelbock that's called the Red Balloon, and we have a White Mosaic IPA that's called the High Hairbrand. So I would imagine that certain people have their special beers that they always order. Yes. So that's also another draw to come into the American Fresh Brew House to try all the different beers and figure out which one you like the best and become a regular here. Well, Mr. Ray Rubinsky, thank you so much for joining us today. It's so much fun talking to you. Continued success. Thank you. Appreciate it. a great time here at the American Fresh Brew House. We just spoke to Mr. Roy Rabitsky, the general manager here, and getting to know about the history of the establishment, where it was, where it is, where it's going. I think I have my favorite right here, Happy Soul. I encourage you to come on down and try out all of their beer selections, not all at once. <laughs> So you can pick out your favorite. It's easily accessible to the Orange Line and it's in the heart of Assembly Row. Welcome back to What's New Massachusetts. Joining me now is author and tour guide, Brooke Barbier. Hi, thanks for having me. Hi, Brooke, how you doing? Good. So I'm so excited about your book. It just came out. Yeah. Tell it, me about, about the backstory to that. Yeah, so the book covers Boston from 1763 to 1776. It's called Boston in the American Revolution, A Town Versus an Empire. Ooh. And it, thank you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I love the subtitle. Uh, it charts the, the resistance and rebellion in Boston uh, between the French and Indian War leading up to the Revolutionary War. What I find really good about your book, and I kind of leafed through it, we're also, we're both with the History Press. Yeah. And I love that you're, the structure, the structure is very interesting structure. And I think that having the key players kind of really helps me as a reader to get, kind of get into the stories. Yeah, thank you. So each chapter highlights a, a key player or a person that I think that the reader should know about in Boston. Some of these names are going to be familiar, names like Paul Revere and John Hancock. Other names like Thomas Hutchinson and Richard Clark, you might not know, but you would have known if you lived in Boston in the <laughs> 1760s. And so it's a way to, to keep readers um, engaged and getting to know these people throughout the book. Because once they appear, they continue to appear throughout the book. So you also run tours as well. Did you find that the tours was a great way for material for your book? That's why I wrote the book was actually at the end of my tours, people said, what else could I read? And I had a list of books to recommend for them, but none of them really suited what I thought was my audience, my, my tour guest audience. And so I wrote the book for them, essentially. Now, any misconceptions, like, like things that you thought were true changed while you're writing the book? Do you mean about history or uh, about writing a book? Um, uh, both. Yeah, so, <laughs> um, Writing a book was, was fun, actually. It was sort of isolating, and, that, yes. and I knew that, but in some ways I found that isolation to be 
fun and really creative and curious, and that surprised me. Um, in terms of writing the book, I, I didn't find too many things to shock me. Um, it, it was more uh, just uncovering these stories and finding the best way to convey them. I talk with my hands a lot. <laughs> I, um, I'm used to telling stories orally. And so to write them down, that was actually one of the biggest challenges, was to write the story in a way that would um, convey how interesting it is uh, that I couldn't do face to face. Now, as far as like the key players, is there one key player that kind of stands out that you kind of uh, gravitate toward? Don't make me pick. I love <laughs> them all. So on the rebel end, I love John Hancock. He was such a character. He would dress very lavishly. He was very generous with Bostonians. And we think of him as a one note guy, especially around July 4th. There's good reason to think of him as the first signatory of the Declaration of Independence. But he was a man around town in Boston. So I love him on the rebel side. On the Loyalist side, it would be unpopular to say this in the 1760s, but I, my heart breaks for Thomas Hutchinson. He, to me, is a really sympathetic figure. Um, he, was, he remained loyal to the British crown, and, and it cost him his job, and it cost him his homeland. He, his, he traces his roots back to the 1630s in Boston, and he was banished from Massachusetts forever. Um, and that, that I find sort of heartbreaking, so my heart goes out to Hutchinson, too. The thing that I got from your book was the sort of the slow build because we think that the like the Boston Tea Party or the Boston Massacre was the, were the beginnings of the American Revolution, and you really pointed out that it was a slow build. Yeah, and that's one thing that we sort of sometimes think, oh well, this is what started it all. Okay, no, 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 this is what started it all. <laughs> but what started it all was when shots actually began to be fired in Lexington. But um, what I find so compelling about history is these are humans, just like me and you. Even though we see them in a different way today, we look back and we see them in a different way. But these are people, and oftentimes men, who, who were improvising. They didn't know what was going to happen next. They didn't know how Parliament was going to react. Parliament didn't know how colonists were going to react. So for a, a period of 10 years, 12 years, you just sort of see this dance between these two groups um, that ultimately resort, results in war, but it could have gone a totally different way. Now, do you feel like that? I know growing up and like reading about American history that we really focus on the patriots and the rebels. Uh, do you find it's important for us to focus on the other side as well? Yes, because there's two <laughs> sides to every story, right? We say that we say that all the time. Oh, there's two sides to every story. But the loyalists, um, th there were loyalists in Boston, and they were the typically some of the richest people in Boston. And so these are important voices that we need to hear. And in some cases, the loyalists were mistreated. Um, <laughs> one of the guys, uh, one of the loyalists suffered um, what was called Hillsborough paint, and he had his house covered in feces and urine. Oh my gosh. Um, and that was named for <laughs> Lord Hillsborough in England. But I mean, it would, this is, that's, that's a nasty thing to do. Not just mean, but that is a, that's a gross thing to do. So in some cases, loyalists are being mistreated. Um, and so it's important that that side of the story gets told too, that it's not a steady march to revolution. It's messy and it's complicated. There was like the mob mentality that, it, yes. that it existed back then. It was sort of, like, so the mob, the role of the mobs in that era was that that was extremely important. Yeah, so mobs and mob violence was actually a socially acceptable way to um, address your grievances. And, and um, that was true throughout the 18th century. And that actually is a tradition that comes from England. So they were being good British subjects. Uh, following in their forefathers' footsteps by violently rebelling. It's only when, you know, it starts to lead to uh, more spirited violence more consistently that it starts to become, for Parliament, more of an issue. Because in some cases, Parliament thinks, oh, this is just the usual violence. But it's not. Right. But we don't know that yet either, right? It's, again, these people are improvising. They're using tools that they've used for decades. And then it becomes something bigger as this sort of tension builds. Well, it's something that I studied also uh, as the story of the Salem Witch Trials yeah. of 1692. It's very similar. It was, it was, a, it was a mob hysteria you know, that happened throughout Salem. It also happened in Boston too. There were pe people that were accused of witchcraft in, in Boston as well. Yeah. Yeah, so you, you find that if one person, I mean, 
it, these are humans, and that's my that's my the best way that I can say it is that people are reacting the way humans today might react. They might react jealously, or they might react fearfully or aggressively, and and that that's what happened on the streets of Boston in the 1760s. So the whole like tar and feathering actually did happen. Oh, that happened. Oh yeah. My gosh. <laughs> oh yeah. Now what I want to say, one sort of thing to clear up is that it's not hot tar. If oh, you okay. think of like paving a street and you smell tar, it's not it's not scalding hot tar. It was more warm tar. <laughs> Still not great, <laughs> no. but but not scalding hot tar. Warm tar enough to lift flakes of skin. Yeah. I mean, it, it could take off a, a, a top layer. But, um, and then covered in feathers. And typically, you were then paraded around through Boston or, or whatever colonial town to further embarrass you. Tarring and feathering wasn't so much meant to hurt you physically as to embarrass you. There was a lot of uh, so cautionary tales or humiliation back in that era. They wanted to use you as a cautionary tale if you defied the status yes. quo. Yes, and that's especially true in the 17th century when the Puritans have a stronghold. Um, and then e even in the 18th century, shame was a powerful motivator, or they, or they thought. So we're actually going to watch the trailer to your book. Oh, yay! I'm so excited. So, yeah. <laughs> Brooke Barbier. Boston and the American Revolution, a town versus an empire is a story about the ordinary people of Boston who lived in an extraordinary time. The book covers the years between 1763 and 1776 and charts how Boston ultimately entered into war with the British Empire. I'm Brooke, the author, and I'm excited to reintroduce you to events and men you've known about for decades, including the Boston Massacre, the Boston Tea Party, Samuel Adams, and Paul Revere. But the book will also introduce you to lesser-known events and men, including those who remain loyal to the British crown. These men include some of the wealthiest and most powerful men in Boston, and even a spy who plays both sides. Together, they form a picture of a town struggling to adjust to changing political circumstances. Both sides rebel, enforce, improvise, and fail for more than a decade. At the end of each chapter, you'll learn about what Boston's revolutionary historic sites look like today. These places include Old North Church, Paul Revere's house, and my favorite, the Old State House. I hope you'll visit and explore these sites. So grab your copy and immerse yourself in one of the most pivotal places and times in our nation's history. I'm Brooke from Boston's History in a Minute, and today I'm in a very historic tavern, the Bell in Hand on Union Street. The Bell in Hand has been continuously operating since 1795, although this isn't the original location. The Bell has moved around Boston in its two centuries of existence. It was originally founded by Boston's last town crier, Jimmy Wilson. He named the tavern after his profession when he carried a bell in his hand and brought news to the town of Boston. The sign that hangs today in front of the Bell in Hand is very similar to the original sign from 1795, although that sign didn't have words on it. That's because literacy rates were much lower in the 18th century than they are today. So people instead relied on pictures to tell them where they needed to go. People knew if they found the bell, they could find a beer. See you soon for more of Boston's Past. And we're back with Ms. Brooke Barbier. Uh, we were speaking with my co-host Sam about your book, and now we're going to talk about your wonderful tours, Ye Old Tavern Tours, that you hold throughout Boston. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so at Ye Old Tavern Tours, we believe that beer makes history even better. Yes. <laughs> and so we walk along the Freedom Trail. We see sites from uh, the American Revolution in 17th century Boston, and then we stop at three historic taverns and have a local craft beer in each. That sounds like so much fun. Now, one of the taverns that you mentioned back from the 17th century was the Green Dragon Tavern. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, the Green Dragon Tavern is the iconic tavern in Boston. Uh, it was founded in, uh, in the 1660s, and we really see it rise to prominence in the 18th century. That's because this is where rebels met throughout Boston to talk about um, planning the Boston Tea Party. They also talked about the movement of British troops when they were trying to monitor them when they thought, mm, the British might attack us. That happened to the Green Dragon Tavern. It was also Paul Revere's local spot. 
I mean, this was his bar. Uh, it was right up around the corner from his house um, in the North End. And so this was his tavern. This is where he went. And this is where John Hancock would go, Joseph Warren, Samuel Adams, these other revolutionary leaders. So it's very interesting. This particular tavern was around for a very long time. So the sociological impact was profound. This is where people went to find out the real news about what was going on. That's right. And so taverns at this time were a great place to convene. You could go and get something to eat, get something to drink, right. but also you would hear the local news. And this often took place by um, someone in the tavern reading a newspaper aloud. Not everyone could read at the time. And so this f functioned in some ways like having a CNN television on in the back of a tavern today. Uh, someone would read the newspapers aloud and then it'd be discussed and argued about. And so taverns were a place not just to go and drink, but it was a place to get news, get informed, maybe um, share your viewpoint uh, aggressively or not. And now this is interesting because we live in the time that we do now, we take for granted CNN being able to read these different things. And because you're taking people on this tour, you're giving them the vantage point of what it was like to live during that time. Because we assume people can read, but pe most people did not go to school at that time. So the act of someone reading out loud was how information was conveyed is a very important point. And how, and I, met, I know we spoke before, and you said that sometimes uh, trials or uh, court was held in the taverns. Can you talk about that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, and that was especially in the 17th century, and it was an energy saving measure that if the taverns were already gonna be he heated and lit, Wow. Why, why pay money to heat and light a courthouse? Makes sense to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this that happened in Boston in the 17th century especially. And you know, and let's just take another direction. There are a number of microbreweries that have popped up yes. in the area. And it's very interesting. What do you think these new establishments can sort of take from the um, these taverns of, of yore? Well, that's a really good question. And I think one thing that beer does is unites people. It gives somebody some it gives some something for people to talk about over right. a beer. You know, that's an expression. We can have a beer or talk about it over a beer. And so um, that was true for taverns at this time, and it's true for these delicious microbreweries um, today, that it's a way to unite people and bring them together. It, it, it's so interesting, and how taverns at that time really were the foci of news, entertainment, um, lots of other things happening. Now I want to get a little bit of trivia from you. Now, Ooh. I know you know all about history. Um, we talked about the Boston Massacre in your book. So can you give us a little bit of trivia from um, that maybe people don't know about what happened during the Boston Massacre? Well, one of the first things a lot of people are surprised to hear is that the massacre involved five deaths. And I don't want to say only five people died because anybody dying at the hands of a British soldier is a tragedy. Mm -hmm but it was five people who died in the massacre. The term massacre was designed to incite anger and unity against the British Empire. Oh, it was propaganda. So today, we wouldn't call that necessarily a massacre, but um, unless you were trying to incite certain feelings in people. And so that's one thing that really surprises people about the massacre is that it was five people. Indeed. And now, Yield Tavern Tours, you actually have little snippets on YouTube where people can go and you have like a one minute clip that yeah. gives a little bit of information. Yeah, our History in a Minute videos. Um, they're literally History in a Minute, which is <laughs> as much as of history as some people can handle, one minute. But it covers uh, the four centuries of Boston's past. So from 1630 to the present, not just the American Revolution. And, and uh, it covers buildings and people and events. And so, um, yeah, those are on our website. It's so informative. I encourage you to check it out. Your Tavern Tours, Brooke Barbier, much continued success. Thank you so much Thanks for Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. It's time for Boston's History in a Minute. I'm Brooke, and today I'm at a really important site in this city's history. It's the site of the Boston Massacre. Around nine o'clock at night on March 5th, 1770, a crowd of between 60 and 200 men gathered in front of the then Customs House on King Street, which is in this area behind me. That crowd began threatening the lone soldier guarding the Customs House, so eight soldiers came to his aid. The crowd was then throwing objects at those soldiers, including rocks and snowballs, and they were taunting the soldiers to fire their muskets. 
one of the objects thrown hit one of the shoulders of a British soldier, and in hitting him in the shoulder, his gun discharged into the crowd. When he fired his gun, the other soldiers also fired into the crowd. At the end of the shooting, three men lay dead, and two died later of their wounds. This became known by rebels as the Boston Massacre, although that was a bit of a propaganda effort. The British simply referred to this event as the Riot on King Street. See you soon for more of Boston's past. And welcome back to What's New Massachusetts. So, Sharon, what are you doing this summer? Well, I like to, be, like to take some of the tours throughout this city because I've been a little lax in that I need to catch up. Well, guess what? I'm actually giving a tour at the Shirley Eustace House in Roxbury. That's right. So <laughs> what should our viewers know about this tour? Well, it dates back to the 1700s. Uh, it has all sorts of architecture. So it's the Georgian style, the Federal style, and then also the Victorian era. So it's a beautiful mansion, perfect for weddings. Uh, it's restored wow. to its original glory from the 1700s. So beautiful summer place for a former governor of Massachusetts, yeah. royal governor. Uh, so it has loyalist uh, backstory to it. And the, one of the things that I truly love about Boston is that it really tries to retain the architectural integrity of the buildings. And so when you come to visit Boston, you can really see the great architecture. So if you're checking out Massachusetts, make sure during the summer that you visit Boston. That's right. Have a great month, everybody. We'll see you next month on What's New Massachusetts. Bye. Bye. Welcome to Boston's History in a Minute. I'm Brooke and today I'm in front of the Warren Tavern in Charlestown, credited as being the oldest surviving tavern in Massachusetts. The Warren Tavern was founded in 1780, just five years after the Battle of Bunker Hill, when the British had set fire to much of Charlestown, destroying many of the homes and buildings. The tavern was named for Dr. Joseph Warren, one of Boston's key rebel leaders who died during the Battle of Bunker Hill, where he had gone to serve as a volunteer. Shortly after the tavern's opening, both Paul Revere and George Washington drank here. Now, while this is the original building from 1780, it hasn't always functioned as a tavern, although thankfully today it does. When you walk in to get a beer, you'll feel the historic vibe immediately with the wooden floorboards and the low wooden beams. Then raise that beer and toast to Warren, Revere, and Washington. See you soon for more of Boston's past.